Hi guys, so I got a request today to do a little bit of a ramble video. This was, today's the 18th of December. Obviously this video will come out sometime in the new year as part of our 365 days of ASMR. So I do have a little bowl. I don't want to tip it, there's milk in there. A little bowl. Uh, I did a little video on some of my little bowls. This was my original little bowl before I got the bigger one. So, I love my honeycombs. But I've already eaten breakfast today. So, this is actually my second bowl, but I can eat multiple, there's a lot of satisfaction for me in eating multiple bowls. So that's what I love about a little small bowl. So, I'll only do, I'll put down below where the eating will end. I know some people really don't like eating sounds, but I know some people do. So, I thought I just might eat a little while I ramble here at the beginning. Just drop some. I'm very... Man, I'm really dropping them all. I actually recorded a ramble a little bit earlier, but it's not actually that bad that I missed it because I just was kind of not finding a topic to talk, talk on. I was kind of just looking all around my room <laughs> looking for things to talk about. But then I did hit on a topic, so. My mom sent me two bags of honeycombs in a package for me, and so this is uh, part of my enjoyment of that package. Did you also go up there? And so, Amano is actually, I used to live in Provo, right before I moved to Australia, and so this is very fine single origin chocolate. You probably heard me mention single origin chocolate a few times in some of my videos, but this is so good. So, I will do a roleplay on that. I actually have another box of Amano chocolates. It's just chocolate bars. But, um, and I've tried to record a video on that probably about three times. And it's never, never turned out how I wanted it.
I had honeycombs yesterday for my breakfast and that wasn't the best option this morning. I had my normal breakfast. I actually have a little thing because I'm in the middle of recording a video on a how to how to do my overnight oats so you can look forward to that video coming as well. And so what I ended up rambling about on my last one actually started off by showing my ring. So I will show you. I am going to focus this in so you can get a good look on it. But I have to kind of look at it. I'm not going to be looking at you. Come on. Come on. shooting it. So this is my engagement and wedding ring given to me by my current love. Um, has an Australian diamond up here. And I don't actually remember all the types of stones, but we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. That's my ring. Now let's focus back on me. It's focusing. Yeah, sorry. So, probably with certain other things about me sleeping on the floor using a miswak, you might not think I would want a kind of traditional ring. And I've had thoughts about that. I mean, I had thoughts about that then. But in my first marriage, I was, it was quite an abusive marriage and really a very unloving marriage. So, we'll talk about the ring, and then I'll get more into the relationship. So, when I was, when we were engaged, I had picked out a ring, and I was kind of insistent about, like, I knew what I wanted. I wanted a triangle, a uh, blue sapphire, and then it had... I think it had a couple diamonds on the side and all. Anyway, so we'd found, uh, anyway, I'd found the ring that I wanted on eBay. Sorry. And, um, so, Janardin, that's the name of my ex. So he had, um, he had ordered it and then it was kind of always... Anyway, and then it didn't arrive, or there were issues with it, but basically he never tried to fix up the issues, or make sure that I got my ring, and, like, it was just something where it got put in the too hard basket, and so I never actually got a ring my first time around. And that was kind of just a little bit of a symbol of that relationship in whole. And so, like, probably if I was how I am now, or if I had never had that experience, I probably just would not even care about having a ring. I'm not a big jewelry person, I don't wear a lot, and I don't really care about a lot of conventions, about what people think should happen, or that sort of thing. I just tend to do my own thing. But, 
because I'd had that experience, I really wanted something in my, like, the next time I had a relationship, I kind of was like, well, I want somebody to actually deliver on that. And so, and so, um, so I found a ring that I liked the look of, but it was just a real little cheapy one. And so it was a rainbow and it had kind of this type of design, a little, a little, kind of some difference in details, but it was just a really cheap little ring. But, um. Uh, my husband, I think he wanted to get me something that made me feel really special. And so he went out looking to see what he could get that would be out of, like, real gemstones and be, you know, a really nice ring. And so he went shopping around and he couldn't find anything. But he was talking to a lady at the jewelry store and she recommended him to this jeweler, and so and it got, we got it custom made, and so and it was, a l I mean, a little bit expensive for probably what we you know wanted, but and so we were kind of tossing up: should we do it? Shouldn't we do it? And we kind of just thought, well, this is like our one chance to actually you know, have a ring and do something special like that, so let's take the plunge and do it. And so, that's, uh, why I got the ring. And so, it wasn't actually ready when we got married. So I got it a couple weeks after we got married. That's, we had a very, very quick engagement. We'll get into that story another time. That's not today's story. So, but, so that's why I'm very, I always, always wear my ring in my videos, because I'm very proud of it. And I love my left hand as well, my little mole, and my fingernails always seem to end up better on my left hand, so it's just, it's the hand. This hand, my nails tend to break a little bit more, I think it's because I'm right-handed, and so they probably get stuck on things a little bit more, so they end up a little shorter, but that was that. So, yeah, I just wanted to tell you, I guess, a bit more of my story in my previous marriage. So I've mentioned before that I grew up Mormon. I left the church about five years ago uh, when I first came to Australia, but that's another story. So, I grew up Mormon. When I was really young, I never really thought a lot about getting married and having kids and doing the whole traditional thing. Not surprising when I'm kind of non-traditional as it is. I just always thought when I was older that I would live on my own, not really even have cats or dogs, that sort of thing, just kind of live on my own. I remember envisioning going jogging in the morning in my hair in a ponytail. I don't know. Anyway, um, so, uh, so that was kind of my view when I was really young of what I thought I would be like when I was older. But then as I got older, being in the church a lot and that sort of thing, that whole mentality of marriage and relationships and families and that that is, you know, kind of the be-all, end-all of everything really started to infiltrate my brain. And it built a lot of insecurity in me. My parents were divorced when I was five years old and I hadn't, I wasn't around a lot of healthy relationships growing up. My grandparents lived on the other side of the country, so I didn't really see them a lot, either set. Uh, both of them have okay marriages. My two grandparents are uh, deceased, but 
Anyway, it wasn't something where I kind of thought of them as my role models as far as relationships go. I didn't really feel like I had a real idea about what a relationship was meant to be. And, and it used to just really bother me. I was like, well, how, like, how do you actually even get into a relationship? And that sort of thing. And so, I had a lot of insecurities around that. So then, when I was 19 years old, and at BYU, and there was, I saw an opportunity to, for someone that I thought would marry me. And that was before we even started dating, but that was kind of my thought process. I thought, oh, this is somebody who will date me, and who will stay with me, and not leave me. And because that was, I think, growing up in divorce, I just thought, okay, well, the last thing I want is to get a divorce. But, so I decided I was going to marry him before we even started dating. And basically, my criteria was he was Mormon, I was going to marry him in the temple and that he would marry me and stay with me. Not the best criteria, and I really did open myself up for what happened afterwards, which was a host of emotional abuse. He was not very verbally abusive, necessarily. It was very subtle, and so even now, it's hard for me to really pinpoint things that he did or said, but he was very, very manipulative, but very subtle with it, just not really out in the open. So I can only really think of two examples, um, like of specific things that he said that show like part of his manipulation. And so one thing he said to me was, Okay, so when we were getting married, the idea was that he was going to work and that I wasn't, I was going to keep going to university because he hadn't been uh, studying at that time. And so then about eight months in, he hadn't gotten a job, hadn't been looking for a job. So I figured, well, we're going to need money. So I finally got a job because I had quit my job, actually, when we were getting married. So then I got another job. And it was a big turning point for me in... because I was actually really depressed when we first got married. Um, just felt so isolated and alone because I kind of cut myself off a lot from my networks. And the only person I really saw at all was my sister, and I still didn't see her a lot when we first got married. And he didn't really talk to me at all. Like, if I did not initiate, we didn't have conversations. And it was, and it was pretty much up to me to do everything. And when I say everything, I really mean everything. Um, I used to take out the bins, I used to do all the washing, I used to do all the cleaning, I did all the dishes, I prepared all the meals. It was about three and a half years into our marriage, and I remember calling my sister because I was so excited because he had offered, he had called and offered, he was putting a pizza for himself into the oven, like just a frozen pizza. And it was a huge moment for me that he had called to offered, offered to put a frozen pizza in for me as well. Like that is the extent. This was about three years into our relationship. So he literally did nothing. And so the two examples I have of the manipulation 
that he had about, or, I mean, not, these weren't manipulative, well, one was manipulative, one was just really, really emotionally abusive, but, so, the one thing, um, so this was pretty late in our marriage, I had been working at a security company, obviously, I was one of, so I ended up losing, um, was made redundant at the first job that I got and then ended up working in security kind of on and off at the same company until I came to Australia. Um, and so it was just a data entry job, nothing really, like a pretty simple job, it wasn't anything special, but it was what was paying our bills, it was keeping our heat on, I, you know, everything he had nothing to want for because I was working, because I paid the rent, because I bought groceries, because I paid the bills. So, and that was done through this job at the security company. So then one day we were having a conversation about something and I don't remember what it was in response to but I distinctly remember him saying this, and he said, I mean, you work at a security company. Just, like, trying to diminish my opinion, make it seem like that was the only thing that mattered, and that I was basically nothing because of the occupation that I had. And this is coming from someone who spent all his time home in bed, on his computer, doing nothing, making no money, doing nothing around the house, just letting me wait hand and foot on him. Um, and so, yeah, that was pretty, pretty shit thing to say. But at the time, and it, it made me angry at the time, but it was also, I was so deep into that mindset that it kind of made me question my validity and worth in what I was doing. And so, that was one thing he said. Another one was, so about two and a half years in, so he used to sleep all sorts of odd hours, and so we ended up sleeping in separate bedrooms at one point. And so in his bedroom, I set up, like, I set up everything. When we moved in, I think he probably carried in two boxes, or his computer in one box, everything else. Me and my brother-in-law, you know, my sister, my family helped me move, but he probably carried nothing. Um, supposedly because of his fibromyalgia, but like four years in, he just started biking around everywhere, doing anything he wanted at that point, and it just seemed like it had been a charade the whole time. But anyway, so, so I had set him up in his bedroom with a microwave right there in the bed, so he didn't have to get out of bed and there were soups and uh, beans, tortillas, and that sort of thing, so he could make burritos or, you know, soups or whatever he wanted right there from bed without having to get up. And he also had a double burner so that he could cook his own food, like little pastas, right there from bed. So he had everything he needed. He had a pot in there. Anyway, everything he needed. But he, but basically because I'd set him up like that, I stopped cooking him as much food because I thought, hey, you're 25 years old, even if you can't get out of bed, you can probably reach over there and grab yourself some food. But he sent me this article talking about how starvation can cause depression and suicidal feelings in people, basically implying that because I was starving him, 
that that was why he was, you know, feeling this way and acting this way and whatever. And I do just want to make a big caveat. I am, like, I'm very... I understand mental illness. I under, like, I don't have it personally. I don't have severe mental illness personally myself. My current partner does have a very severe mental illness. And I, you know, I love him to death. Like, I care more about how somebody treats me versus, you know, if you have issues, that is fine with me. I don't care about having issues. I mean, I care about it in that I want you to do what will help you with those issues. But I think no matter what issues you're going through, you can still treat people well. And so that's my problem with Janardin, was that it seemed like, did he have issues? Didn't he have issues? I don't really know. And he treated me like absolute shit. So, yeah, I kind of hate him for that. But that being said, people struggling with mental illnesses, I just want you to know I'm definitely in support of you in doing what is required to help you. But just being open and honest with those around you is the best way um, to deal with it rather than just trying to subtly throw them hints and guilt them and be manipulative. Anyway, so, yeah, so those are kind of the two things I can think of. He also drove a bit of a wedge between me and my sister, which still is there to a large extent, but, I mean, in some ways I can only blame myself. I invited him into my life. I'm a very strong person, and I gave up my power and strength to him, and so I am a victim, but I also made myself a victim, if that makes sense, but anyway, so not a big fan of him. So we ended up, so I mean, I just, I don't even know how to convey how bad it was with him without being like, I mean, he never laid a hand on me or anything. That was kind of the opposite of what he did. We also never had sex. Literally. I was a virgin until I was with my current partner uh, before we got married. So, anyway. Five years of marriage and still a virgin. But anyway, if you want to know more about that, just leave a comment down below and I can make another video. But I don't always know how much people want to know about that sort of thing. So, we, so it was about um, three months before he, like, so he ended up leaving me. He was going down to his parents' house for Christmas, and it was kind of indeterminate. It was kind of like he was going off, and that was going to be that, and then he was going to come back, but we weren't going to be together, but he was going to live in the house. So then he left, and then I was like, nah, if you're not going to be with me, just, no, you're not coming back. So I was happy that I said that, but not that I didn't ever leave him, because he was a real jerk. Anyway, so this was about three months before that. So we had a conversation, and he basically was implying, he was never direct, it was always just trying to undo the puzzle of whatever bullshit he was spinning. So, he had said that he, oh, yeah, that's, he made it seem like I was just way too over-eager and that I would interrupt him, sorry about that, um, that I would interrupt him when he was doing something and you know, that basically the issues in our relationship stemmed from that I tried to initiate too much in our relationship. So I was like, okay, you know, feedback, that's fine. I can take that on. So I was like, okay, take a step back. I won't initiate anything. I'll just, you know, leave it to you because it seems like I don't feel like I'm doing that much, but apparently it's too much. So leave it. I went for a month 
We went for a month without talking. Very dark time for me. And, um, he only initiated one conversation with me that lasted, like, ten minutes. Like, literally, otherwise, he didn't say hello to me. He didn't try to come and hug me. Didn't try to find out what was going on with me. Didn't want to know anything. Nothing to do with me. Anyway, so I think he ended up leaving because when I, um, started to know Mark, my son, um, I was, like, he was in a really bad spot, and so I was spending a lot of time talking to him, and I switched my schedule because he was in, like, he was a bit suicidal and really turbulent emotional state, and so I was worried that I was going to lose him or that something would happen, and so I just spent a lot of time online so that he could talk to me, basically that I could be there anytime he needed me to. Except, obviously, when I was working, that we would be able, you know, that he'd be able to talk to me so that I could try and help him through whatever would be going on. So, anyway, with the backdrop of Denarden was never talking to me unless I was talking to him, I don't think he liked that all of a sudden I was spending all this other time on something besides him, and I think he kind of just saw me as, oh, she's not waiting hand and foot on me anymore, no more use to me, I'll just ditch her, basically, is what it really looks like happened. So, pretty awful. And it took me a long time to come to terms with the fact that I had been abused, because emotional abuse is something that's not talked about a lot, and a lot of times it's talked about in the sense of verbal abuse, like perpetually being called, oh, you're an idiot, oh, you're stupid, and that sort of thing. And he didn't, and I don't know if I would have picked up on that sort of thing anyway, but he didn't say things like that. It was more, I mean, you know, just like that thing about the security company. It's like, I mean, you work at a security company. Like, that on its own, you can kind of think, it's like, sounds a bit innocuous, but in the backdrop of you are literally doing nothing, and this is what's actually keeping you alive, like, you think you'd be a little more appreciative. And that also implying that I starved him, basically. So, anyway, but it took me a long time to come to terms with that, and... So, yeah. Anyway, that's, I was just going to talk a little bit about that relationship. And, yeah, so that was my abusive five-year period while being abused. And it was just, to me, the biggest sign for me that I was abused was as soon as he left. I mean, I had a little really short, turbulent um, you know, crying and that sort of thing, but it was really short. For the most part, it just felt like a huge weight off of my shoulders, and I felt like I could be me again. And so, it was, so the year after that, I was just loving being single, and I just was like, man, not, I'm gonna be single forever, unless, like, it would have to be really good to induce me to not be single. And that's an attitude that I feel like is really important. I think it's really important to be okay with yourself single. And and so I feel like, yeah, that that's really important. So my one piece of advice for all the young people out there, all the old people as well, is to be okay with yourself just on your own. Because that, for me, is when I found the best thing that could have ever happened to me, which is my love. So, we'll get on to that another time. But, thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed a little bit more personal look into my life on this little ramble video and my eating my honeycombs. So, thanks for watching. Remember to be sure to... Uh, comment down below for your chance to be included in my next 
viewers appreciation video. I, oh god, sorry. I love hearing from you guys. It's one of my favorite parts of making videos is just being able to go along and see all my comments and be able to talk to you. So just, uh, yeah, be sure to comment so that we can just keep this thing going. And I will see you next time. And also, obviously, if you have any topics you want for another ramble video, put them down below. I don't know what that was. And also, yeah, any requests, because we got 365 days of ASMR, so I got plenty of room to try and meet all your requests. So, see you soon, guys. Bye. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha